talked yesterday about filling in the gaps uh, in your personal experience in order to secure a headship. Um, and um, that's great. A lot of people are getting on board with that. But the trouble is, how do you know what to do next once you actually get the job? So I'm going to develop some of the points made by both Mark from yesterday and uh, by Ellen this morning uh, to try and uh, amplify some of those. Some of what follows can only be done uh, by a head, but there's lots that you can do as a deputy or assistant head to get ready. So we're going to work on some of those things today. Now, the secret of good headship isn't having a lovely curriculum or even nice exam results. Parents and your colleagues expect those things. The secret on starting well is in the brand that you present to the world. It's about your credibility and the values that you bring. There's a big saying in industry that people don't buy what you do, they buy who you are. And when you take over and you're expected to lead a school, there'll be a certain level of expectation placed upon you by your new colleagues, by the children, by the parents and by the governors. And your personal credibility rating as judged by them will have an enormous bearing on a number of things. Firstly, how you're perceived, and secondly, how willing everyone is to follow and to support you, and that's crucial. That you might bring with you a high level of credibility because you're already well known in an area in which you work, and your reputation precedes you. However, if you're joining a school whose location is completely new to you, or where it's unlikely that the existing staff have very much knowledge of your previous record, it can be a different story. You need to pay a great deal of attention in your first year and particularly in your first term to earning that level of credibility that will enable you to share your vision and subsequently achieve it together with that team. They won't come with you unless they believe in you. And just like teaching, head teaching is the greatest role play game at all, of all. If you act like a head teacher, people will follow you because you're a head teacher. And there are certain things you can do to, get, uh, to gain immediate credibility with everyone you meet. Think first of all, pay attention to your appearance. Think about what kind of image you want to create and create it. You see the face that looks out at you from the mirror once in the morning, but it'll be seen by everybody else all that day. So what kind of a face do you want everyone to actually see? It's probably a cliche, but if you look the part, everyone will treat you accordingly. Even in 2020, it's still easier, I suspect, to command respect with a neatly trimmed haircut, a smart suit and a purposeful stride than it is with, what shall we say, a, a more ostentatious personal style. Really important to connect with your people. Remember people's names. Use them whenever you talk to them. For example, when you see Mrs. Smith in the playground in the morning, rather than saying, hello, how are you today? Make a point of saying, hello, Mrs. Smith, how are you today? Remember personal details about individuals and their families so that you can make reference to them when you speak. When you remember these kinds of details about them, you make people feel important. So ask them about their ill parent or their oldest child's exam results or driving test or whatever it is. Get to know your families and your staff. With your colleagues, if you can't remember the name of their children or their partners or their staff birthdays, write them down. Don't be afraid to build up a little fact file that you can refer to and crib before you meet people. The secret, I think, in the early days is being seen to be everywhere, or at least create the perception that you're everywhere. Be seen at crucial times before, during and after school. Build opportunities to be seen by committing space and time to your diary, which ensures that you're in the places that you've identified as important. Be at the concerts. Talk to everyone on parents' evenings. Be in the playground. Invisibility is one of the greatest criticisms parents have of school leaders. Be visible. Also, as the old saying goes, listen more than you talk. If you want people to support what you're trying to achieve, make them feel important by taking an interest in listening to what they have to say. Develop the skills of active listening. Make it look like you're interested. Timekeeping is important too. Be more than punctual. Arrive before you need to for all your meetings, whoever they're with. Set an example and expect it of others. Otherwise, it looks like you don't mind sloppy timekeeping. When your diary is completely full and you can't afford the lost time of anyone being late, every minute is crucial to you. So set that a good example. And then start each day positively and cheerfully and stay there. 
again, it's a bit of a cliche, but happiness and humor and personal well-being are infectious. Smile. Live the message you espouse. Model the behaviors you expect of those you lead. Set the standard you do. So it's to set the standard in everything you do and stick to it. Lead by example. It can't all be about personal brand though, can it? And nothing else. You do need some substance and action to back you up. But first impressions do matter. Find out what sort of school you're in. Seek the, val the views of your key stakeholders. Introduce questionnaires or su suggestion boxes as a matter of course in the way you work and respond to whatever issues these actually raise. So I've used Microsoft Forms, Google Forms, SurveyMonkey to build my own uh, questionnaires and then to help with the analysis of the results. Ask the parents, ask the staff, including the non-teaching staff, that's crucial, and ask your children too about their views of school life. Perhaps take a sample rather than do everybody all the time, then no one's being asked year on year on year, or a section of the school population. And once you've got some ideas of what the feedback looks like and you've got some projects you want to embark on to improve things, build yourself what's called a Gantt chart for the year. That's simply a graphical representation of where tasks will appear on the calendar. And set yourself some targets, stick to those, and set yourself particularly a target of being able to tick off the next 10 things I'm going to tell you by Christmas of your, or, or the end of your first term. Get yourself draft one of a strategic improvement plan, and that should be ready to write, and it should contain no surprises, because you've already been out and engaged with your staff and talked to them about it, and they've seen your thinking, so they should know what's coming. You should know how to add value to your student outcomes as a result of working out where the low-hanging fruit, as they call it, of improved um, performance exists. Take those easy wins to build that reputation. And successful leadership is less about you doing everything and more about you ensuring that everything that needs to be done actually gets done. And you need your staff on board for that to happen. So make a point of getting to know the names of the, all the staff again within that first week. Make a point of studying both the personal and professional backgrounds of your teachers so you know what makes them tick and appear knowledgeable about them when you meet them. Call into their workspaces informally. <coughs> Greet staff personally when they arrive for work. Use the names. By Christmas, you should be able to segment your staff into various categories. Firstly, there are the change agents, the leaders, the future implementers and creators, the go-getters, those sort of people. Secondly, you've got your sound, solid, successful practitioners, and the challenge with them is probably to add that extra 5% to make them like, more like the Category 1 colleagues. And then you've got a group, the blockers, the mavericks. You've seen them before. They've, they've seen it all. They don't take much notice of what you're trying to do. Um, and I'll talk more about all these sorts of stuff later. Think about what curriculum changes you're going to need for the next academic year. Think about how well your behaviour and reward systems work. How good is teaching and learning and how good are the results uh, that the school actually gets? That's two questions, I suppose, isn't it, really? What do the stakeholders think about the school? That's the questionnaire I mentioned a minute ago. Think also, what is it like to be a vulnerable child attending your school? How do interventions operate? What uh, are the attitudes of the staff towards kids like these? What's it like to be a new teacher working in your team? Is there successful mentoring? What's the induction process like? What I'm trying to get you to do is think about the school in its entirety and make sure you are prodded and poach your nose into every particular aspect so you've got a broad understanding of what it's like. But those, I think, are key ones. Additionally, think about what are the indicators of success that you've agreed with your governing body for your first few years. Uh, are they taking responsibility to help you get there? You can't do all this stuff on your own. If you don't have access to governors and you're working through school, that may be substituted with your senior head. I think a key thing to do in establishing credibility is don't ask others to do what you wouldn't be prepared to do yourself. So do run an extracurricular club before you ask others to do so. Do some duties, teach some classes. On every occasion, do whatever it takes to make sure you deliver an outstanding lesson. But don't make a big deal of it. The staff room grapevine will soon do that for you if you're on top of your job. Teaching is also a great way to legitimately question the children and see their attitudes to learning in action. You can gauge so much about one of your colleagues when you cover their class. 
you can see about the class routines, you can look at their personal organisation, really get to understand them better. Take the opportunity to look at the children's books while you're in class. Look at what they write and how they're marked. In all formal situations where you're seen by the staff, whether it be staff meetings, whole school assemblies or whatever, ensure that your preparation and presentation are outstanding. Set that example, expect it of others. All these things are seen by all the teaching staff and all the children, they're high profile events, you've got to get them right. I think establishing credibility with grown-ups is one thing, but establishing credibility with the children can be the hardest. They're the most important people in the school, so start as you mean to continue. But do be aware, different sorts of schools can need different approaches. Um, at one school, I got things really right. Um, I had lovely children at the school, but they were so rough at playtime and I had to stamp on that. It seemed to be all of them and I was, I was worried how they would react. But when I calmed things down, the vast majority actually were really grateful. At another school, I got it totally wrong. Uh, I had to get tough with uniform and banned a particular style of rucksack. And I really hadn't expected the backlash that this brought about, not from the children, but from the parents as well. And that set me back a wee bit. You're gonna drop a clanger, you're gonna make a mistake in those early days. Get over yourself, it happens, plow on. It happens to everybody. Think about the role of the school council. Is there anything there you can act on quickly on any of its decisions? Are there some easy wins to be gained? Is there a desperate need for a particular facility or a resource? See if you can get it. All this builds up your credibility with the kids in those early days. Think about policies relating to behaviour, reward and competition and so on. I think if you're a successful senior leader already, the next points I'm going to make will be what you do every day, but I'm still going to mention them anyway. Spend the lunchtime each week with the children joining in with their activities. When you have to tell them off, and you will, avoid humiliating or embarrassing them in front of their friends. Pay compliments to the children where you can, especially the ones who have a reputation for poor behaviour. Catch them doing something right. Think that whatever you don't challenge, you effectively condone. So challenge every incident of unacceptable behaviour wherever and whenever it takes place. And do the same with staff as well. And make sure they're backing you up by following those small rules. That builds the culture. Create an open door policy for your children so they know you really are there for them and let them know that nothing in the school is more important to you than them and they can always come and see you if they need to. Don't shout, try to deal with everything calmly, fairly and consistently and again that's for children and with staff as well. Another crucial area to build relationships, we know that children's success in school is heavily influenced by a positive home school relationship and dissatisfied parents take their business elsewhere and will tell the world how bad you are when they do so as well. So think about how you can work with your parents. Without them recommending your school to their friends, you won't have a school for very long. So it's important you get this right. Some schools introduce parent forums. I suggest you keep a space in your diary at certain times each day so it's known that you will be available to see parents if, if needed on an ad hoc basis. And say, get out in the playground and talk to them. And when a parent telephones you to make an appointment, try to get back to them as quickly as you, as quickly as you can. Try to make an appointment when it's convenient for them if you need to see them. You might want it between 9 and 3.30, but if they're a shift worker or a doctor, they genuinely can't change their work patterns at short notice, so you're going to have to be flexible. Always follow up on every concern immediately and get back to the parents to tell them the outcome. And this is especially important if it's parents concerned about something like bullying, in which case drop everything and deal with it now. Always return your parent phone calls the same day, even if all you can say is, I'm on it, I haven't got anything to tell you yet, but I haven't forgotten you, and I'll come back to you tomorrow. If you have a parent meeting, Find out as much up-to-date information as you can about their child or their children, both in relation to schoolwork and their lives outside school. And this way you'll appear knowledgeable about the circumstances and you won't drop any clangers about family splits or difficult times, that kind of thing. And give the impression you know and care about the child. The visibility thing, again, is important. Be seen in the playground at least once a week before school, the same after school and more if you can. Don't wait for parents to approach you, go and see them. It's up to you, you take control, begin conversations with them. And try not to go to the same parents each time as that can generate an impression that you have favourites. When you're in the playground, before or after school, make a point of talking to the children too. Be seen to be interested, caring and friendly with them. You're a teacher, you, I'm sure you are interested in caring in them, but these impressions as far as uh, parents looking at you 
really, really do matter and they spread, they spread and grow that credibility. Once you're in the job, you're the leader. The book stops with you. Now, a huge amount's been written about what constitutes good school, school leadership. And I've put some little quotes on the screen there for you uh, to have a little look at. Throughout all these books and all these quotes, there are some uh, constants and key threads. Lead by example, model the behaviors you expect of others. And we've already hinted at some of the components of that. I'll summarize them, some, some again. Have a clear philosophy and a clear vision and share it with everyone regularly. Understand the importance of delegation and empowerment and create an environment in which there is shared leadership. Ellen on one of her slides said, you can't be a dictator. Have really good interpersonal skills and if that's not your forte, find some way of developing them. Create learning communities. You read widely, use social media, follow research, for example, Education Endowment Foundation, people like that. Really important to be calm, but decisive. Don't be a panicker. Be prepared to take some risks though. You never gain anything by just keeping exactly the same. And most importantly, allow yourself a sense of humor, including the ability to laugh at yourself. So leadership's important. And sometimes people think leadership is more important than management. It's not, you need to be a good manager too. Manage yourself before you manage others. Create good systems for yourself so that you're free to manage other people. Look after your own personal needs. Try to find time at least once a week when you're able to do something that gives you relief and rela relaxation away from work. Commit yourself to it and ensure you always do it. For some people it's yoga or running, for others it's reading, classical music or a walk in the country. Eat healthily, go easy on the coffee and drink more water. And as Ellen said, link up with heads in your area. It doesn't matter whether they're independent or state school, there's much to learn from everyone and their whinges and their issues will be the same as yours. And that's actually really reassuring. If you are in one of the local primary schools, attend your cluster meetings. If you're independent, ensure you attend your association meetings. Join one if your school doesn't already have one. Get yourself onto social media. Uh, Ellen again mentioned Twitter and LinkedIn and some great groups out there. Follow the ISP to see what courses are available and keep yourself up to date. Then get yourself a proper PA or at least some secretarial support and work with them to look after your diary and do the simple admin tasks that can bog your day down. And this is true whether you're in charge of a 70 pupil village school or a 2000 strong student high school. Establish efficient and effective communication systems and procedures across the school and do so for yourself. Make sure you have the right IT. Learn how to use Outlook properly. Its calendar and task functions are awesome. And most people I come across can't even use all the email features properly, let alone the other two thirds of the program. You can do things like schedule in Teams or Zoom calls into your diary. You can allocate tasks to yourself and to other people and deadlines. It will change your life. So if you can spend a bit of time doing anything, learn Outlook. Establish some clearly defined roles and responsibilities for all the staff in your school. Create job descriptions if there aren't some, so people know what they're actually supposed to be doing. Spend time developing efficient and effective communication systems because communication is everything. There's always someone who says they didn't know, be it a part-timer, someone on maternity leave, or quite often just someone who didn't listen. If you can't get your message out there and they're not hearing it, you fall down. I think that we mentioned vision and so on. Setting your vision and getting others to buy into it, it's a whole separate session, as is change management. However, you can help these processes along by establishing the right relationships with your staff. Remember, your staff are people first and teachers or cleaners or secretaries second. So look after their personal needs as well as their professional needs. Apologies, by the way, if you know anyone that works at Welbeck Primary in Nottingham, this photograph is their staff. Um, they did put it on the website, so I'll consider it their game. In order for your vision to be realized, it's important to accept that it's not just you alone who'll be delivering it. It's gotta be everyone working at the school. You've gotta demonstrate real belief in your staff by giving them the opportunity to develop leadership skills so they can deliver their part of the vision. Various ways in which you can do this. 
I think meet with every member of staff individually in your first couple of weeks to identify their interests and their particular strengths, not to mention any alternative agendas they may have, and they will. There's always somebody who fancies themselves for the job you've inherited, someone who thinks they should be promoted, someone who doesn't agree with the philosophy. Work out who they are. If you can, try and agree a small project for every member of staff, which will lead them to achieve some success early on, and so create high motivation and self-esteem, and get that done in the first few months of your leadership if you can. Then recognise, reward and celebrate the achievements of every individual. And again, personal knowledge is essential here, whether it's knowledge of their child's graduation, that they're going to run their first half marathon, yeah? find out. And once you've established yourself and earned that credibility with the staff, there'll come a time when you feel ready to delegate tasks to others. Have you heard the saying, if you want someone to do a good job, give them a good job to do? It is true. It's got to be meaningful. It's got to be purposeful. Excuse me a second. And in choosing who to delegate to, Remember, you've got three kinds of people on your staff that I mentioned earlier, and you need to work with all three types. Each one brings different gifts to the party. So think about the characteristics and work out who's who. Your first group are the life enhancers. These people are characterized by dynamism. They're often inspired. They see the good in every situation. I think these are the sort of people who get on with things and don't waste time, be that theirs or others. These are the people who have a can-do mentality and will always find a way for things to be done and always seem to have the time, don't they? These are people who create a feeling of well-being and reassurance in others around them. They're the sort of people who can be relied upon to deliver. The sort of people you want in the staff room. They never find anything too much trouble. They're They've got positive energy, they, they, they're, they're doers, and they speak and they behave politely, they don't put anyone's nose out of joint, they're the kind of people that you want around. The David Winfields of this world. And I think one of the things that you can rely on them to do is to achieve highly and regularly bring about exceptional outcomes. So they are valuable members of staff. They're the ones who will respond to your ideas with excitement. They're the ones who will always volunteer to cover that extra duty and stand in to take that club when a colleague is absent. And they all seem to have time to do things. <clears throat> Type two, or what I've christened the lawn mowers. Now, every school needs these sort of people in order to function efficiently. They work hard to do the right thing. They're good colleagues to have around. They care deeply about their roles and their responsibilities. They try not to let others down. They sometimes feel the pressure though, to be honest. They're consistent, they're effective workers. And again, these are the sort of colleagues that you do need. They achieve perfectly well. The kids like them, they get on with things. They don't offend or upset the colleagues uh, in the staff room. They have a neutral, they, they don't sort of enhance people, but neither do they diminish from them either. You, you, I'm sure you're thinking of someone right now in your staff room who fits these sort of char uh, characteristics. They're probably functional without being inspirational. They're the sort of people who will accept new ideas if, 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 you, if you're persuasive enough, um, and they'll do what's required most of the time. That, thankfully, is the bulk of your staff room people who are prepared to get on and do as they're told and will engage. You'll have a few life enhancers, but somewhere tucked away in the deepest, farthest corner of your staff room, there's group three. And these are what the business psychologists call the obstructionists or the mavericks. I prefer the analogy to Harry Potter's Dementors. If you're not familiar with the, book, uh, familiar with the books, the Dementors are dark creatures that consume human happiness. They create an ambience of coldness, darkness, misery and despair. And because of their power to drain happiness and hope from human beings, they've been set the duty of being guards at Azkaban, where they prevent the pr prisoners from having the will or the ability to escape. Substitute Azkaban for your staff room and you've probably got the picture. And again, I'm sure as a senior leader, you've come across these types um, in your role. These are the ones who can always see the reason why something shouldn't be done. They tend to sap the energy of others. They tend to damage morale. 
sometimes these are the colleagues where, to be honest, you've got to question their commitment sometimes. Um, they don't always do as they're asked. They rarely deliver the goods, but what they can deliver really effectively is excuses as to why they didn't. They might even blame others when things go wrong. Unlike your life enhancers, these people say they're busy all the time and they can't possibly fit another initiative in. Yet, when you go into the staff room at lunchtime, these are the ones who are sitting around with a cup of coffee in their hand, pontificating, and they seem to have all the time in the world. They're the ones who don't much see the point of change. We tried that in 1986, it didn't work then, and it's not going to work now. And they're the ones who can often upset colleagues, parents, and even children with their insensitivity. If you've got an argument coming from a parent's evening, it's probably one of these guys that's caused it. Unfortunately, you can't ignore this group, or at least you do at your own peril. They have to be won over, and annoyingly, some of them will have key experiences or knowledge that you actually need to move forwards. So learn who your staff are, get them categorised, understand them. Because choosing the right person for a job is crucial if you want to delegate and ensure the right outcomes. The person to whom you delegate an important task or project needs certain characteristics. And even that group three may have these characteristics at times. You need someone who has the motivation. You need someone who really does share your vision and understands what you're trying to achieve. You need someone who has the skills to actually make these things happen. Someone who understand, understands the requirements and is prepared to do what's required in order to deliver on time and to your standards. And again, finding these people is not easy. Whenever you delegate a task, you have to accept that the person who's going to deliver the goods will bring their own ideas, their own initiative and creativity. So adopt the 80-20 principle to delegation. That is, if you end up with 80% of what you envisage in the first place, be happy and celebrate the achievement. It's very unlikely that everything you delegate will be done exactly as you had hoped. But if you get hung up on this, you'll find yourself thinking, if I want something doing properly, I'm gonna to have to do it myself. And then you're on the road to exhaustion and to burnout. Ellen, did you hear that? Yes, <laughs> thank you, I'm listening to your advice. <laughs> The most effective heads are those who realise that they don't have all the answers and are prepared to actually listen and take account of the ideas, initiatives and suggestions of others within the school. So actually listen. Encourage your quieter members of staff to talk things through with you. There's always other staff room will dominate the discussion and the ones will slink into the corner. Bring the quieter ones out as well. Allow your staff to tell you things you already know. When you get more experience, you find you're able to manipulate the discussions in the nicest possible way. So that new idea you actually wanted comes from them. Develop proactive questioning skills. So how do you feel about that? What would help us to do this better? Along with empathetic responses and active listening skills. Remember what Benjamin Franklin said. He said, any fool can criticise, condemn and complain. And most fools do. So the lesson is work with your staff and be open, don't criticise, be constructive. If you get the structures and relationships right, then you can guarantee that most of your staff will feel motivated and supported. And the psychologists have developed this motivational loop, which looks rather like this. It suggests that people feel motivated when they're doing things they enjoy. So give them a challenge within their capabilities. People feel motivated when they're trusted with real responsibility. They feel motivated when they're fully supported in that role, not just cast out. And if they've got everything they need to carry out the agreed responsibilities, they'll be happy and productive in the task. And we can help with that sense of achievement when we recognize and celebrate their efforts. Sometimes a project can take quite some time to complete and it's important not to wait till completion before recognizing the various milestones that have been passed along the way. And a reward can be a pat on the back. It can just be a kind word in the corridor. You can slip a card into someone's pigeonhole or mention them in a staff meeting, but keep on saying well done and thank you as they go on and reinforce it at their appraisal meetings and formally document the success they've had. And if you can encourage this loop, you'll see a much more happy and productive staff. 
And people actually don't mind taking on extra work if they believe there's a point to it and they're making a difference. You'll notice I haven't mentioned teaching and learning yet. And if you get all this other stuff right, people will have a pride in the school and they'll believe in you. So when you want to mention something, something contentious or more difficult, they'll listen. Experience suggests that teachers are content to change in some areas, but their pedagogy and their resources and so on are the most deep-seated and most highly protected asset they have. Whatever they're doing, they fervently believe it's the right way to do it. Until recently, all we as heads had was our belief that things could or should be different, and fostering change could be a real uphill struggle with some colleagues. However, we now have a growing body of research and st statistics to suggest the optimum ways of doing things. You should read widely and be familiar with all the current initiatives and arguments out there. Even if you decide to hand over this to a teaching and learning deputy, you still need the overview of options and initiatives. Follow people like the Education Endowment Foundation on social media, especially Twitter and LinkedIn, as Ellen suggested. Follow Ofsted or ISI, follow the DfE, and there's a whole host of other people you can follow. You do not, in my opinion, have to have every teacher teaching in exactly the same way. Just like the children, each one's a different character from a different background and was trained at a different time. Each will have different strengths and personalities that work with certain children and work less with others. Harness all those differences, celebrate those differences, but get them all to visit each other, to learn from each other and build up a cross fertilization of ideas and approaches as much as possible. You need this evidence base, because if you're gonna provide a learning environment in which every child can flourish, we've got to understand what motivates them and how children learn. And your colleagues, some of whom have been doing the job for 30 and 40 years, may well have forgotten that. So we need to reinvigorate that. You want children to be leaping out of bed in the morning because they want to come to your school and know that the whole day is going to be a magical and rewarding learning journey. Be honest, does that sound like your school? Does that sound like the sort of school you want to work in? You have the power to make it happen. So go through a lengthy and full consultation with all your staff, looking at the evidence, looking at great descriptors from your inspectorates, looking at examples of good practice, Produce a detailed teaching and learning policy which sets out your agreed expectations in every aspect of teaching and learning in your school and link this to a widely discussed and agreed behaviour policy. And if there are gaps in the staff understanding, invest in some CPD and then monitor it so you can check this is all being implemented. Biggest failure, new heads in a busy school when there's so much going on, it's the monitoring that gets neglected. You put all sorts of great things in and they just die a death because you haven't got a chance to revisit them and make sure they're em embedded. How can you do that? Well, use things like learning walks and informal visits to classrooms to establish classroom culture, expectations, challenge for the able, support for the vulnerable. Make sure your staff know it's not an inspection, but that you have to know what's going on because you're responsible. Build in regular work analysis and regular assessment analysis. I know you don't change things just by measuring them, but if you don't measure them, you'll never understand what needs to change. So on your screen is a document I used to use. It's what I call the Monitoring, Evaluation and Review Plan, the MER. My SLT used to hate this because once it's written down on here and it's agreed, there's no escape. The jobs had to be done and you were humiliated around an SLT table if you hadn't done your bit. We focused on walks around the school. We have focused on the assessments being done and any other helpful activities. And we scheduled a, a formal analysis into the next senior leadership meeting so we could review what was going on. It's a great way of ensuring you have all the bases covered. It's great ammunition for your CEF because you'll need to develop that as you're going along as well. Uh, it does cause extra work, but it's the only way you can schedule in and make sure that everything is being done. And personally, I love to work for schedules that would go in Outlook, that would be a task list, all that stuff on there. And um, Outlook would tell me every day, have you done this? Have you done this? Have you done this? You've also then got external factors to think about. Governors, for example, they have a legal duty to hold you accountable. So don't hold them at arm's length. Use their expertise to help. Build in strong relationships with your chair. And if they're not up to date, explain their legal duties to them in the nicest possible way. Remind them about things like health and safety and safeguarding. Make it your top priority to talk to the chair in the first few weeks about how they're going to measure your success. It can't just be about the results and the next inspection. 
the governing body have appointed you so they must know what they want from you. And after all, if you as a head fail, they fail as well. You need to set up an informal session we get with each of them. Some schools even go and visit them in their workplace to build relationships and to open up a community dimension. After all, they're gonna spend lots of time in your workplace. Find out how they want you to present the head's report. Think about length, style, tone. Do they want it in PowerPoint? Do they want it in Word? Because getting this agreed early doors can save you such a lot of time later when you, so you don't have to rewrite it. Within your first term, you need each member of the governing body to come and participate in a learning walk with you so they understand what the school's about and then get them to feed that back at the next governing body meeting. Also, find out what role your leadership team has with the governors. Can you possibly delegate some of the subgroups to your deputy, to your assistant head, or, or, or whatever, if you have them. And then, and this is the bit that most aspiring heads don't have an overview of, there's all the stuff to do with health and safety and safeguarding. How are you going to ensure that your legal responsibilities are completely being fulfilled without wishing to scare you? If you get it wrong, you can go to prison. Scrutinise the work of your DSL. They've got a hugely responsible role make sure they're doing it properly and give them some support as well. Their record keeping matters. The staff training records matter. Ensure that everything's completely compliant and there is a safeguarding culture in the school, not just a box ticking exercise. Your staff have got to believe that what they're doing is right for the safety of the children. When you're in charge, you suddenly inherit a building as well. And that's probably something as a teacher you've never done before. You need to do some kind of due diligence on that when you start. Think about layout and design of the building. Do a walk with your building services team. You might even need to commission something called a condition survey to enable you to plan the repairs and maintenance cycle of work for the next three years. A sudden surprise that costs you £10,000 to repair means that potentially some of the planned expenditure you had set aside for your learning can't take place. So get round so there's no surprises. Think about areas for improvement. Are there any areas that are dangerous? Are there any areas where the children can't or shouldn't or should be going? They want to make it lighter and brighter. If you're going to change something, refurbish your reception. The first thing that visitors, students and parents see when they come into your school is reception. So make, make your mark. Put pictures of learning up and make an exciting, vibrant, pleasant place for people to wait. So what can you be doing now then to get ready for all this? Well, work closely with your current head. As the year cycles round, try to shadow them so that, for example, you've seen a, be a budget being put together, that you've planned a whole school diary and a timetable. You can start now working on key members of staff, perhaps do their performance management and use your own performance management to help as well. Make sure you've got objectives set that are the learning of a new skill or process. And because if it's new performance management, you can't escape from it. It's got to be done. Get yourself out in the playground and practice handling queries from parents. Do a health and safety site walk with your health and safety officer. Plan, take responsibility for planning the next inspection in your school. You become the in-house expert familiar with all the inspection criteria and the great descriptors. And this is all useful for you as a deputy because after all, if the head goes off tomorrow, you're in charge anyway. So you're expected to know how everything works. At the end of the day, success, like everything in a school, comes down to the quality of relationships. If you get that right, you'll find your people will move mountains for you and forgive you the old blunder. Get it wrong and your first job is going to be a very long uphill struggle. The term head teacher is totally misleading. You are the senior teacher, but you're also the senior executive of a multi-million pound corporation uh, with legal responsibilities for finance, health and safety, safeguarding, personnel, quality control, customer care. It's a heavy load, but as I said earlier, it can be the most invigorating role you'll ever have. So I wish you good luck in your quest. If I can be any help, do drop me a line. There's various channels of communication that open to you there. I'm gonna unshare my screen. I'm gonna hand over to David, and if we've got any questions, I think we've got a couple of minutes where we can, uh, we can look at those now. Thank you for listening.